Thank you so much, everyone, for being here tonight uh, on probably the coldest day of the year in London so far. To get a good turnout is very, very important. So thank you all for coming. And could we just say a big thank you to those people that have been involved in the campaign for Julian's freedom from the very beginning, those that have braved cold, wet days outside Belmarsh to make sure the whole world knows about it whenever they go past Belmarsh, and of course to Stella and all the campaign for their incredible work, determination, and the principles that they brought to this campaign. Thank you very much. <laughs> Because having been in this hall over many years, and some causes are popular, some are unpopular, some are very unpopular, and some are just disliked by all the media. We've been here through all of that and all of them. And the Assange campaign has gone on for a very long time. And I suspect whatever happens on day X is going to be going on for quite a long time after that. So be prepared to get to know each other very, very well. <laughs> Because you'll, you'll get to like each other very much. <laughs> and could I say thank you to all the other people, other friends that are speaking on the panel tonight. Uh, I heard Len and um, I know Richard Bergen very well. I want to say a big thank you to David Davis, just, not just for what he said just now, but his um, very principled stance in Parliament Bravo. in support of civil liberties and human rights. Um, we go back a long time when... Um, Both of us have frequently disagreed with our own front benches. I've even disagreed with my own front bench when it was my own front bench. <laughs> <laughs> if, if, you, if you understand the subtlety of that particular <laughs> message. Um, and so it is um, important to also recognise the role that has been played by much of our media in this. Now, this is, by any standards, a global story. When a very well-known, very famous, very brave person, Julian Assange, uncovers deeply uncomfortable truths about a lot of things, not just the USA, about global corporations, about the horrors that went on in various wars, and about the way in which governments operate to try to silence dissent and opposition, and the right to know. I ask myself, where have the majority of the British media been during all of this going on? Yeah, yeah. Even when there's a case going on in the High Court, not 10 minutes away from their offices, who are the journalists there? They seem to me to be, and I've been there quite a lot myself, from every other country in the world, except this one. I mean, is it the problem they have over transport around London? I don't know. But I just hope that when we're there in February, there is going to be serious, detailed, and extensive coverage of this absolutely crucial trial because it matters to all of us. It's not whether you agree with or disagree with US policy on Guantanamo Bay, disagree, agree, Iraq, Afghanistan, and so on. You do need to know what is being done in your name. Yes. You do need to know how those decisions are made. You do need to know what the consequences of those decisions are. And uh, when we, David and I, went to the USA in uh, 2015 in support of people in Guantanamo Bay, uh, we had a lot of very interesting me meetings with people in the House and in the Senate, and it was fascinating actually to watch the workings of it and uh, we journeyed from office to office throughout the Senate building and the Congress building and then we got to a meeting with John McCain. I must say I was looking forward to this one with some interest but also with trepidation. I only, the only image I ever had of John McCain was him on television during the um, presidential campaign and he came into the meeting um, he looked a bit grumpy, to be quite honest, but then he had good reason to be, because we later knew about his condition. He then spent about 10 minutes with a total diatribe against um, President uh, Obama. He said, OK. And then somebody whispered to me, don't worry about it, he does this every morning. It's how he, how is he, how he clears his throat, how he, gets ready, how he gets ready for the day. And then he settled down, and we had 
a very good conversation. I haven't said anything during this at all because I was advised that my friends such as uh, David, who have more military experience than I do, shall we say, um, should engage with John and see how it went. And then he looked at me and said, why haven't you said anything? I said, no, I was speaking to the experts. I said, no, come on, you must have some opinions. And then he looked down a crib sheet he'd got in front of him about my um, political activities and record. And then he paused and he looks at me and he said, oh, Mr. Corbyn, you've got quite a record. <laughs> I said, well, does that affect your judgment? And they said, no, no, not at all. I want to hear what you've got to say about, about um, Guantanamo. And we got on to that. And so here was um, a right-wing American politician who had been in the Vietnam War, Republican candidate and so on, lots and lots and hundreds of things I would totally disagree with, quite prepared to agree with this very broad platform of British politicians that had come about why Guantanamo Bay was a horrible, and is a horrible and evil place, and that nobody should be sent there. There should always be a process of fair, open trials for everybody all over the world. If he can do that, why can't Biden, and why can't all the others where Julian Assange is concerned as well? That surely is a message we have to be able to put forward here today. And so I want to just um, add to this really by saying that um, this is about the role of journalism in the world. Now our newspapers uh, seem to me to produce less and less informative news, more and more opinion, and all of our TV channels find global reporting more and more expensive. Um, entertainment and opinion much cheaper to broadcast. And this is a real problem. So often the world is much less well informed than it ought to be, much less information goes out, and um, as a result we all know much, much less. I want to know what's happened to those journalists that have died paying the ultimate price trying to bring out the truth. Eighty have already died in Gaza, Many more have died in other incidents all over the world, in Colombia, in Congo, in Mexico, um, disappeared in prison in Egypt and many, many other places. And so I say to all our journalistic friends, if you want to be able to pursue your profession in the way that you should, to pursue the truth, to look for the real issues behind any particular story and be protected in doing that, then you need to be standing with and supporting Julian Assange. Because if Julian ends up in a maximum security prison for the rest of his life in the USA, obviously that is abominable and appalling and virtually a life sentence for Julian but it's also a message to every other journalist around the world. Just suppose, just suppose for a moment, you're a young investigative journalist in Ivory Coast, or Senegal, or Nigeria, and you discover that there's a waste dump that's dumping European waste there. And that's toxic, it's poisonous, it's dangerous, and it's damaging the water courses, it's damaging the health of children in the area, it's leading to the environmental destruction of your community. You want to report about it. And somebody says, you want to be careful saying this kind of thing. There's some very big businesses involved in this. They're not going to like it. Remember what happened to Julian Assange when he reported on things that were unpopular? It's just a sort of idea that there will become a self-censorship of journalists all over the world because of the fate of the bravest one of them all, which is Julian Assange. That's why, one of the reasons why, it's very, very important to get behind him and get behind his campaign. We have gained, we have gained international support for Julian in lots of places. In Australia, where he comes from, in this country, there's a lot of people giving support, not so much in Parliament, but there's an awful lot of people around the country. 
We've raised the issue of the Council of Europe, which I'm a member of, and we'll be raising it again next week when there's a session in Strasbourg, and we'll be having events in support of Julian there. But other countries have also come out in support, and uh, I was in Mexico last year, and I went to the um, daily media conference of the President, President López Obrador, he invited me to come along as a guest to, uh, he has a press conference for an hour and a half every morning on live television. It starts at six in the morning, but he usually runs much more than an hour and a half, sometimes three hours. Uh, he has a lot to say. Um, and, um, he just um, said to, to me, would you like to say anything? And so I said a number of things, but one of them was to thank him for speaking out to the US president about Julian Assange, and then he repeated at some length, in some detail, how Mexico had consistently raised the issue both with President Trump and with President Biden, how he had already offered that if it was needed, Julian Assange would always be welcome in Mexico and be given permanent resident citizenship. That's what he wanted. Um, the only thing he had to come, he said, and he just wanted to make that clear as have a number of other governments around the world. So that support is actually growing around the world. And so we have to make sure it grows even more. So as we get ready for this hearing um, in February at the court here, let's make sure the whole world knows about it yes. and recognize that um, it, the, court, the case will in all probability end up at the European Court of Human yeah. Rights at some point, and uh, we will carry on campaigning for it. But with Len, I went to see Julian uh, in the autumn, and we spent ages trying to get into, um, uh, into the prison to see him. We got there and saw him, and it was an absolutely fascinating and very humbling time that we spent with him. We obviously talked about lots of things, talked about how, how he was feeling and the condition he was in and so on, and I, was, I just left absolutely full of admiration for somebody that's been so long in prison, been so badly treated, so psychologically tortured just by being in a maximum security prison on top of the years he spent uh, in the embassy, that he has survived, that he has that wonderful inquisitive mind always searching for the truth and always looking for the information that we all have to find. So I think tonight's speaking just needs to be send this message to Julie. We might be here in Conway Hall, it might be a bit cold outside and so on, but actually, Julian, we're with you and we'll be with you as long as it takes for you to be able to walk in freedom on the streets and go back to your very valuable work of finding out of the abuse of power by the richest and most powerful in this world the damage it does to the poorest and most vulnerable people on this planet, and why journalism, real journalism, is designed to make the rich, the powerful, the political classes, and everybody else uncomfortable. Because if you hold office, if you hold a powerful position, you should be uncomfortable, because you're holding it in trust on behalf of other people. I don't mind being held to account by journalists. I do mind being abused and lied about by journalists, but I don't mind being held to account because that is what journalists should do as part of an open, free, and democratic society. That's why Julian Assange must be free. Thank you.